But now it used to be the case that you could ask questions. But you have the screen down. You have to have the screen down for that. Hi, I just called about having a uh, tech problem with the live stream. That's true. Because I remember I did it for. Uh, Is it wrong? No, no, no. We got it. We got it working. So don't worry about it. I can't think it was anything yeah. now. Right. In New Mexico. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Oh, wait, it's down the screen. You can put the screen down. Well, if you don't put it down, you can't see questions coming in. That's what I mean. Well, you have to, I mean, no, you have to, you have to, you have to turn that thing on. Lock right. on. Yeah, oh, okay, turn that thing on. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. I don't know where, I don't know where, where do you see the questions? Oh, if you log in and uh, turn the video on, onto the screen, it will be a way to chat. Yeah. On, on, on the video itself. Those who want to ask questions can do that through the video. Thousands of people out there waiting. Oh, yeah, waiting for the video. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and getting to the, uh, the streaming. Uh, uh, like video streaming, you see if you need uh, I'm not sure I want to start. <laughs> um, you know, I made mistakes, mathematical mistakes in my life. <laughs> but I've either caught them before I wrote an abstract or after the talk was given. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, the fundamental problem that Carlos and I had about the Poincaré lemma seems to still exist, and I discovered this after I wrote the abstract. So what I want to do is, is just very quickly outline the uh, PV topology, Picard-Vessio topology, uh, and then discuss the Poincaré lemma it's reduced down to a fairly simple statement, and maybe you can provide us with a solution. And, and then I want to, at the end, uh, give the projected application we had in mind. Uh, again, it's not a complete solution to the problem if we have a point grade lemma, but it's a significant piece of information about uh, what's known as the growth and Period, period conjecture, at least in co-dimension one. Uh, so that's sort of what I want to do. Now that I got the mea culpa out of the way. Uh, uh, the first thing is PV topology. So this, of course, is work that Carlos and I were doing uh, the last couple of years. Uh, and I'm just summarizing your work that uh, mostly Carlos's. So the first, can you show take a differential ring? But because I want to apply this to schemes, it can't be just a ring with some derivations. So we have to use uh, the, the alternate definition uh, that was provided by uh, by Andre. So what this means is, you have a map A, you have a derivation into omega, where B is a derivation, omega is a locally free. A module and we want omega to be generated by 
uh, dA. So what this is asserting basically is if I take A, I haven't put the base in here, but you know this is going to be a differential ring over some base. So I mean this is a derivation over that base. So I have a, a map from here into And here, that's the universal derivation. And then this derivation, D, comes from a homomorphism into omega. This is D. This is D, A mod C. This condition here, then, says that this map is on to. What is C? And what? What is C? Constants. Of what? Of whatever the derivations. As I said, I didn't... Oh. See the constants for whatever it is. When, uh, when you say a d is a derivation, what kind of linearity it has? It's an a derivation. So it's it's a additive. Mm -hmm. No, it's not a additive. Of course, it's additive. It's c additive. No, it's additive. It's c linear. Oh, linear. It's c linear, linear but a additive. and satisfies the Leibniz yeah. rule. Okay. Uh, what this does is, instead of specifying ddx1 through ddxn, or something like that, we can use this diagram to see what happens when we change rings. You know, the differential ring map is going to be mapped from an A to B, which commutes with these things. So. That's what we're going to talk about. And then we're going to say that M is a module with a connection. is D finite. Uh, sorry. So if I'm given M, a module with a connection, for A, and I'm given an element M in M. So I'm not saying anything about the module. It can be infinitely generated. It's an A module? But, but it's an A module, yeah. Uh, you know, with a connection. We say that an element in there is D finite. If the smallest uh, A module with connection containing the element M is finally generated as an A module. So this really comes from uh, Andy's work over the last couple of years. When he came here, he talked about R dot modules. Uh, and he was doing it in terms of differentiation, but uh, what Carlos did was extend it to this setting with this definition. So to say the smallest A module with connection says that the intersection of all the A modules with connections that contain the element M is actually finite generated as an A module. Mm -hmm. So, so the, that connection could be something different from the original connection? Uh, it's, a, it's a connection relative to this differential structure. No, 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 no. The, the smallest A module with connection, does that connection have to be compatible with the M connection? The connection in M or something yes. else? Yes, it's a sub-module. It's a sub-differential sub module. Oh, okay. Right. So all this is is... is, is putting the material that you talk about when you talk about Picard-Vessio extensions into a context where you don't have to explicitly write down the derivations D1 through DR. Uh, so then, I, I 
don't want to say much more about this because all I want to do is, is try to see, is give you the definition of the unique topology and what the point is to it. And it's the point actually we talked about in BAMF, uh, namely that you can solve linear differential equations locally in a PV topology. Uh, now, the, the situation of interest here is the one that uh, I guess William calls what, schemes with differentiation? Mm -hmm. So that's what we're interested in. So I want to fix uh, x to be a smooth locally in the theory in scheme over a, uh, a field of characteristics here. What I'm going to use for the differential structure, of course, are the local coordinates. So I'm going to, my omega here is going to be the one forms of x over k. The differential structure then comes from uh, you have to excuse my sloppiness. I should write spec K, but I don't mean that. So then the PV pre topology. Remind you, the notion of a pre-topology, both the pre-topology is you specify a category, and then in that category, you have to define what the notion of a covering is. And that has to satisfy three axioms. Once you have that setting, then you can develop uh, sheaf theory. You know, pre-sheaves are contravariant functors. It's a sheaf. If uh, given a, a, a section on some open U, uh, two sections on open U, which agree after some covering, then they have to be the same. Uh, and given sections locally on each of the opens in a covering, which agree on the product, because the fiber product is replaces intersections, they agree on the fiber product, then there has to be an element on the big open, which restricts correctly. So you can develop all of the sheaf theory, you can develop a cohomology theory, that kind of thing, and it, the characteristics depend on what pre-topology you're using. Now this is not like what we heard in the fall semester last year, uh, who was it? We heard a couple of talks about both of the topologies. Oh, yeah. But he, he, he wanted, he worked from the formal definition, not from the standpoint of a pre-topology. Mm -hmm. And I prefer pre-topology if you can use it because I think it's intuitively clearer. Intersections get replaced by fiber products and you can take the sheaf axioms and read them off pretty directly. Uh, so the PV pre-topology, I have to specify the category. So it's going to be on the category uh, consisting of y at x. So this is supposed to be differential map. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Don't put the gun on this. So I have schemes like this. Uh, and to say that it's in this category is going to say that there exists an eight tile cover. E 
ui 2x by uh, it's all maps. Intersections can be replaced by fiber products. So this is an open inside of x. Actually, it's a tau over x. I have my y here, so the intersection would be fiber product. So that's y cross of x with ui to u i. Uh, this is a D finite map. Uh, and the North is consensus has got to be by half on open. So there's two things you get to think about. One is what's a definite map between differential schemes? And the second one is what's the differential structure here? Well, ui to x being a tau, the differential structure say, extends uniquely. So differential structure on x extends uniquely to a differential structure on the uis. Then, I have this map from here to here. Now, there's a differential structure on the y, differential structure on the ui, but and a differential structure on the ui, because I'm starting with something that's smooth, this really is still smooth, and we really captured all the differentiation. But that's not true for y. y has, is some kind of extension of it on which the derivations defined locally by coordinates on x extend to the derivations there. There may be additional derivations on y, but we don't consider those. This definition here to say that I have a map, differential ring says I have a map from whatever this locally free thing is into whatever this locally free thing is that makes everything commute. That it says these derivations extend. And there may be additional derivations down here. So the, the derivations here will not capture all the coordinate functions necessarily. Now, but this is, you have to prove it, but it's still a, a good differential map. What does it mean to be definite? Well, the ui is affine. And if definite says that I can cover this thing by affines, such that when I look at the map on rings, if my, my affine here is a B, so I have a map from A to B, B to its omega, so I have a diagram. What I want is that all the elements in B should satisfy this definite condition. So it's saying that the elements in B, have, I, if I take their derivatives to arbitrary order, they're going to be contained in some finitely generated B module. Where is A in that picture? That's, that, that's here. This thing A is here, ring on, B is up here. Ring on UI. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So this is affine. Exceptions on UI. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so I think there's of, an affine ring. Okay. Right, this is an affine ring. I'm covering this by affines. So I have a map from an affine ring here to an affine ring here. That's the arrow goes the other way. 
So this is a differential map. And what I'm saying is that any element in the ring here can't generate, by differentiating it, with respect to any of these derivatives, it can't generate an infinitely generated B module. So they're always... So they're all differentially algebraic. Not, not even more than that. Uh, you know, they, they're not going to be... Algebra, uh, they're not going to be independent. I'm saying basically that it's a linear, that's the substitute for a linear equation, that they satisfy a linear oh, right, equation. Right. Okay. Linear with different algebra. Okay. I have to formulate it this way, though, because I'm not necessarily over a field. So I can't just say that the leading coefficient is going to be 1. But I can. Just limiting it this way, you know, I can't build up some kind of an infinite algebraic extension from this. Do, well, does, do the uh, A, I's all contain K? Yeah. 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 Everything's, like those, a base, that's our constant. Canonical base. So everything's over, over K. And K is just a differential field that is a field of constants. Yeah. And in fact, it, what, what I want us to talk about a little bit is case either going to be C, complex numbers, or a number field, Q okay. bar. Oh, so there are constants in the field? Yeah. yeah. I, it depends on your setup. Oh, okay. It doesn't have to be, though. Right. right. So those are the objects. And you should think of my think as an object like this is generated by a, uh, a linear differential equation over x. That's what this d finite condition is giving me. What do you mean by generated by a linear equation? If you just looked at that definition, you wouldn't see. Uh, they have to be any element in here satisfies the equivalent of a linear differential equation. Why is that part of that definition? Because it is condition. But that's if you're just taking a module. Where's the a module? Any, any m. Oh, OK. Yeah, any, any m is can in here has to, the differential module it generates has to be finally generated over base a. So M is in some A module. So I specify the M. The M is the algebra of Y up here. Yeah. OK. That's the, That's the M. I can, because I have a differential map, it has a connection structure on it. And the condition here is that any element in there, if I take that element and differentiate it, Look at the differential submodule generated by it. It has to be finally generated as an A module. Now, I should point out one of the first things we had to do was restrict this definition to Noetherian rings. Because you want submodules of finite generated modules to be finally generated. So that's the locally Noetherian condition. So that's the category. And if I happen to have a differential equation on x, if I can solve it, you know, the Carbessial extension or some extension, then it will give me an open in this category. So then the question is, what are the coverings here? Well, the coverings are the easiest part. The coverings. Y are families flat maps. Uh, I said that we work badly. Coverings of Y consist of subjective. 
flat families. Y alpha EY. Alpha is some index set. Now I write it this way, but remember the Y alpha has to satisfy this condition. So the Y alphas are not totally arbitrary. The Y alphas satisfies this definite condition over some tau extension. You probably don't want every vector to be A. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I better put EX too, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. No wonder it didn't look yeah. usual. Can I ask about, does flat mean your like, linear differential equation is varying nicely? No, I mean, it, it's roots. Okay. Yeah, the map here to here okay. should be flat. The subjective condition says that you may prime ideal here, there's a prime here hitting it. So what it says is this is a, a family of faith, this is a faithfully flat family. And, and that's the one where the, the standard descent theory applies. So the, the, the key new element really is introducing these. All right, so that's the That's the topology. So what do we know about it? So I'm going to let X P V be the, the site consisting of that. So when I write this, I'm thinking of the scheme X but with this particular growth in the topology. Uh, so we got some arrows relating these. PL, no. This is the standard notation for X with the flat topology. So the opens here, the objects here, are Y to X, which are flat and locally a finite presentation. And you know, I should use this chalk. It's been sitting in my bag for <laughs> three years or something. <laughs> so this is X equipped with opens five from there. Now, an open there is going to be an open here. Uh, I said these the objects here were flat, and that was a mistake. The objects here are things that are locally finite presentation over X. The coverings consist of maps like this, which are flat and surjective. So to get from an object here to an object here, I'm imposing an additional condition. Well, if I have a map of topological spaces from X to Y, 
I want to see what it does on sheaves, I need the open sets in the original space. So I take an open in each space, take its inverse image. Well, so if I take a PV open, I can think of it as a flat open. That's why the arrow goes this way. And a covering here is a covering here. Okay. Yeah. The site is this picture over here. Okay. Yeah. Can so think, what this really is is just a changing. I'm changing what my allowable opens are. What? Can you think of original X as an algebraic D scheme in the sense of yes. human yeah. play? Yes. Yes. That's the way I'm thinking of it. Okay. When I'm writing it like just, this. just intuitively. Yeah. 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 Uh, the, the only catch is that this one is not. Thought that yeah, I was wondering what that was. Because right, this one, I have to have a map from the differentials of y over k right. to the differentials of and, x over k. And what is y to begin with? What kind of being? Something that's a little bit of free, finite presentation. But it, it's, a, it's a scheme with a finite? Yeah. Oh, okay. But it's got to be a differential map, so I have to have right. this map. Basically, as Kyle has explained to me, what we're doing is we're looking at the differentials here. The differentials here pull back, right. and I need a splitting of that sequence. Because this all sits over K. Yeah, right. And it, I, this gives rise to a sequence of differentials. Right. And that differential sequence, in order for this to be a differential map, that sequence, you have to choose a splitting of the sequence. Can you think of it as a, at all in the, in, in the sense that we usually think of it? as a differential variety? Is y a differential variety? Yeah, except that if this x is projective, I don't have any, something global. See, this is here all because there has to be some way of capturing what happens on non-affine things when I change oh, okay. opens. Okay. That, that's the whole. Okay. And that's why I, was, I wanted to skip over, really, because I. I agree. The way I think of it is locally in yes, terms of derivations. Right. You know, uh, but the, the transition functions, really you have to see it in terms of what happens on the omega. Not the omega 1 x over k, but the omega that's been selected. Okay, thanks. So I have a map like that. Uh, I also have a map to the Atal site. So Objects here are x, and objects there are etal over x. Well, it's etal over x. It's here. Uh, yeah. And coverings in the etal site are collections like this. This is etal to x. This is etal to x. As a consequence, this is etal. So I want the the union of these images to be all of y. So it's the same picture. There's a map here too. I'm going to call it epsilon 1. And then finally, oh, I'm not going to call it epsilon 1. I'm going to change my letters in a moment. The Italian map is Zariski because a usual Zariski open is ipso facto an etal open. So I have a map there too. Uh, so I'm going to call this one epsilon. No. I'm going to call this one tau. And I'm going to call this one epsilon. One. Is there a nice characterization of the stops? Uh, not clear that it's false. We spent a lot of time thinking about it. I mean, you can construct stalk talk. You can construct stalks by doing limits, but it's not. They're not like uh, the strictly local rings because it has to be. It, it, it's a well. There's some controversy between Carlos and me. Is it a local ring a tall or is it a ring? in which any definite 
differential equation has a solution. That's what really, in some sense, it ought to be. Uh, like when you're looking affine in a tall and it's just a polynomial yeah. ring where you've added something. Right, but you have to have these solutions to these differential yeah. equations. And there is this PV closure, uh, but it's not clear whether we want to do the. Carlos is arguing that it ought to be uh, solutions of differential equations that are d finite over x. <clears throat> I'm arguing for a local ring in which any d finite equation, you know, I could have a chain. I could, I could have my x oh. here, I could have a d finite cover of it, and then have, up here have another definite differential equation. You get a solution here. This one might not be definite over the base. But if you take the union of all of these and play, play some game like you do for the other end closure, you can construct a uh, PV closure for fields. And my argument is sort of that's what we should be doing for stocks. But it's. So the issue of adjoining solutions is more delicate than in the Atal case? Yeah, and it's essentially because of this thing I pointed out that, <laughs> did I erase it? Yeah. This one here. If this is a tau and this is a tau, this is a tau. Yeah. Not true for d finite. So you have to interpolate something. I mean, there are stalks, because the flat topology has stalks, but it's, they're not as useful as strictly local rings. All right, so uh, this x is always being fixed as a smooth uh, variety locally, locally in a Therian scheme over a field of characteristic zero. So the properties that we can show are I take the PB cohomology of Now, for star of f, so I've got an f, which is going to be a coherent sheaf here. I pull it back to get a sheaf here. Basically, all I'm doing is I'm saying, if I have a PV open, I take my coherent sheaf here and tensor it up. So it's just base extension. So the coherent chief cohomology PB site looks the same as the Sierski cohomology. The interesting feature is this one here. It says that the PB cohomology of one upper star of, what am I going to call it? Oh, I just said F. F. Isomorphic to the tau cohomology F for F. Well, it's true more general, but just to say, let's do it this way. A locally constant. Torsion sheaf. For F, a torsion sheaf Well, like what? Well, obvious one. We win. Those are the nth roots of unity. So on a on a Y in PV site. I just take the nth root to unity in the structure sheaf. That's going to define a sheaf on the PB side, as well as on the ATAL side. So this is an example of a torsion-free sheaf 
PB site. If I look at GM, so that's the sheaf on the etal site whose values on AU are the units that ring. It also defines a sheaf on a PV site. So given a Y to X, the values of GM on Y are just the units in Y. So all this follows from descent theory. And there's some name for, for topologies that satisfy the fact that sheaves defined by objects are representable, but I always forget what it is. So these are useful things. This is by no means obvious. Now, let's see, did I lie to you? Why is GM a torsional sheet? It's not. I, 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 this is another example. I, I should be a little careful here. F is sheaf represented by. Smooth sheaf. It's also true, I can take limits in both cases. So F could be a limit of she's like that. Now I've got GM there. But the condition that it be smooth is important. And the reason is that Grothnick showed that if I have a sheaf defined by a smooth group scheme, the cohomology here and the cohomology here is isomorphic. So what happens is this one's trapped in between. Whenever I have a map like this, of course, I have a spectral sequence relating the cohomology here and the cohomology here. And that theorem of Grothnitz tells me that the higher direct images of epsilon on a, something that's represented by a smooth group scheme vanish so that I can conclude this result. but still it applies to uh, both these cases. Well, so it would apply to the constant sheaf of complex numbers, right? Yes, the limit of, anyway. The next question we really to look at is, this captures in some sense the singular cohomology with finite coefficients. That's what a tau cohomology does. But it can't capture singular cohomology with complex coefficients. And the reason is that the tau cohomology is defined over any base. And in characteristic P, you can't define a cohomology theory with values in uh, something at degree zero because there is a, a elliptic curve which admits quaternion action. So if you had a cohomology theory whose H1 was correct for that elliptic curve, it would be two-dimensional over field characteristic zero the action of the quaternions would then have a representation on that H1. But you can't have a representation of the quaternions on a two-dimensional vector space. So this was pointed out, this is, I think it was due to Sayre way back when. And that's why a tau cohomology starts by looking at finite coefficients and then taking inverse systems and you know, the usual kind of 
playing a game with it. So our thought here was, well, we're going to restrict to characteristic zero, because that's the one where we know we can always construct picard bessio extensions. So we're not going to be faced with that kind of problem immediately. That's something to look at later. Can we get the PV cohomology of the complex numbers this way? So that brings me to what I'm unhappy about. Oh, no, before we do that. Yes. I'm never going to make this. It's already 120. You're going to have next time. <laughs> I don't think there's a logic version. There's no logic version. No. Anyway, so let me review something in the classical set. Because first to review it, but second because I want to make a point about it. Uh, so my x is going to be a complex analytic manifold. So that means, of course, it's automatically smooth. Then a dimension n. So then I'm going to get a sequence that looks like this. There's a terrible notation, but for sure. So this is the Durham complex for X. It's terrible notation because I haven't indicated this is analytic. This way, this is the one time I'm going to write it. So the point gray lemma in the analytic say, I'm thinking of these as holomorphic differentials. This sequence is exact. That's what the point gray lemma says. says is if I think of cohomology in chief terms, then I have a spectral sequence converging View this means we just look at this complex. It's a graded complex. I can take a Carton Eilenberg resolution of it. That's going to be bi graded. So my injectors are going to go upwards, but I want those upward resolutions to also resolve kernels and co kernels and homology. That's the cartan eilenberg resolution. So that means that this complex generates a doubly graded complex of injectives. And a doubly graded complex of injectives, when I look at, if I, if I take the single, single graded one I get by adding degrees, then I have a spectral sequence converging to that. And, this, and the homology of the one I get by taking the singularity of one is this. It's got a bold face H here. So I've got a complex here. It says resolve the complex by injectives. 
take the associated uh, associated single resolution, take its homology, that's the hypercohomology. It's complex. Now when you when you look at the E2 terms here, well, my intensity is going up. I can take the homology this way first. Well, that all vanishes by the point gray lemma, except for this one. Then I take, I can take this injective resolution, and I've done global sections on it, so I'm getting this. So if I first do the homology this way, then this way, I get this. On the other hand, if I do the homology first this way, and take global sections, I'm getting the HQ, so up here, of omega P. So this says I'm getting HQ X and coefficients of omega P. That's take homology first this way, then this way, and it converges to this. Well, this, of course, is the high spectral sequence. And the interesting fact about this is Lean, one of the first things with gave criteria for spectral sequence to degenerate, you apply it here, this spectral sequence degenerates. So what does that say? That says that any one of these cohomology groups here has a filtration. And the quotients are, are one of these groups. You have to get the indexing right. I was too lazy to do that. But you get one of these groups. Okay, so there's a filtration on H, P of H, H, M of this, whose relative quotients look like one of the H, Q, omega, M minus Q. Well, Deline didn't stop there. Because... This exact sequence really comes by looking over the reals at C infinity forms over the reals. I, I forget all these names you attach to it. But what that means, of course, is that you take the complex of C infinity forms, tensor or the reals of the complexes, you get, you, know, you don't get this one, you get something that's equivalent to it because. I'm not saying I'm getting holomorphic forms that way. I get uh, you know, ones that are C infinity in the complex sense. But what that says is the complex conjugation acts invariantly on that complex. So complex conjugation, well, we know how it acts on here. So to me is saying that if I look at this, things that are fixed by complex conjugation are these things. And the complex conjugation has to act on this. And what he goes on to show is that I take H Q P. Uh, let me shorten this. So this is going to be H Q P. If I take its conjugate, I get H P Q. What does that say about the filtration? I have my filtration whose quotients look like this, where Q plus P is M. And now I take the conjugate of that quotient, 
And I get something that appears somewhere quite different in the filtration, unless P equals Q. So what, what he's showing is that that filtration actually splits. That's a consequence of that fact. So the fact that complex conjugation acts on C results in the, the HM of this is a direct sum of HPQs. Not just the filtration, but a direct sum. And of course, if Q equals P, so they're variant, then we have the Hodge conjecture, which says that if I have a cohomology class that has rational coefficients, and when I extend it to this, it lies in HPP, then it has to be generated by a cycle. And it's a well-established fact in co-dimension one, basically the exponential sequence does. All right, so what I wanted to emphasize was complex conjugation on C is not the same as complex conjugation here. And it has very real consequences. Because it turns a filtration into a direct sum decomposition. Can I ask a question? Maybe I'm just confused. There are other parts besides just like Q plus P equals N, right? We're not working I, on this. I'm, I'm just looking at HA. Okay, okay. Uh, because this degree, because it's degenerated, this degree here is a combination of Q plus P equals N. Now this line doesn't make sense because we've already removed. So, when I was writing the abstract, I had in mind the following theorem. You shouldn't write this down, by the way. I'm just recording. Context. So this, of course, this is just simply the statement of the Poincaré lemma. This is the Poincaré sequence here. The delta means I'm taking, if I, if I have a basis for the differentials of coordinate functions, which I can get by taking an atal cover, then delta are the derivations given by those coordinate functions. So this thing really is the algebraic analog 